and welcome to Banfield, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, if you have been a regular viewer of this show, first of all, thank you. And you may also know that we have now been on the air for about 15 months. Uh, but I have a little story that I would like to share with you tonight and uh, bear with me. So before we signed on live, um, we had to hire all of those fabulous people who work on this show, and that is a big task. <laughs> First, you've got to find the candidates, and then you've got to check resumes and references, and then do all the interviews, and <sighs> the interviews are the longest and most important part of the task. It's the, the get to know ya. And while I was in the middle of all of that, uh, something kind of weird happened. A candidate who came highly recommended uh, was one of my top picks to be on the team. She had a great resume, and I even agreed to conduct the Zoom interview while I was on vacation, um, but it was a slam dunk. She was terrific, and we both agreed it was a great fit. So I moved forward with the process to bring her on board. And then just a few days later, out of nowhere, she told somebody else that she'd taken another job. I was blindsided. I couldn't believe it. It just seemed so unprofessional. Plus, I was kind of ticked that I had spent so much time and effort on hiring her kind of felt like a waste, but I moved on. I didn't give it another thought. And then fast forward seven months later, uh, she reached out saying that she'd made a terrible mistake and she'd never have taken that other job. And then she professed her admiration for this show and, and our work and she apologized profusely. And then she begged to be given a second chance. And I ignored my instincts. And I did another Zoom interview, and she seemed genuine and keen um, and wanted to work for us. And for the second time, I agreed to hire her. I told her I needed to confer with a couple of people and get the process rolling. And wouldn't you know it, within a few weeks, I heard through the grapevine, she'd accepted another job somewhere else. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, uh, you know the rest. This whole thing really kind of stuck in my craw ever since this, right? So when I read in the Wall Street Journal about a new phenomenon among Generation Z called ghosting employers, I snapped to attention. Turns out I'm not the only one who's had this happen. It's a thing. Major companies, according to the journal, say that between 15 and 20% of new hires just don't bother showing up for work on day one and are never seen or heard from again. Before this kind of professional ghosting started, yes, employers were reporting that employees would often quit without giving notice or just stopped showing up for shifts. The practice even got a nickname, no call, no show. Employers are also reporting that they're being stood up for interviews as well. I get it. It's a tight job market out there. Lots and lots of jobs, not enough candidates to fill them. So the candidates can kind of pick and choose, right? Buyer's market. But is this now the professional norm? Need I remind everybody there is a recession looming and jobs are about to dry up. So is this going to change? Or is Gen Z profoundly different than we were decades ago? A generation that sees things totally differently and fears confronting real people with uncomfortable interactions. Maybe because so much of their life has been lived on a screen and a keyboard through no fault of their own. And if you're thinking, oh, come on, who cares? We all should. Because within about two years, Gen Z is gonna make up almost one third of the workforce. So ignore them at your peril. Joining me now to figure this one out is Rob Brelo. He runs the Boulevard Wine Bar, which is in Long Island uh, City in Queens, New York. He's been ghosted even more than the national average. Rob, I, I had to do a double take on, on this stat, but 90% of the applicants that you've had haven't even shown up for scheduled interviews at your company. 90% scheduled an interview and ghosted you. That's pretty typical for me for at least the last five years, I'd say. What do you think is behind this? It's hard to say. I mean, I'm in New York, so, uh, and Boulevard is uh, a restaurant bar in Long Island City, Queens, and there's restaurant jobs all over the place. So getting an interview is not really a difficult proposition. The real issue uh, is then once you've got the interview to decide to go, to 
get out and go and and do and see the the place and talk to the people and if they're not willing to go do that then there's really no next step um and it doesn't really matter what i'm hiring for it's not specifically for servers it's not specifically for uh dishwashers or chefs it's all the way up to management and it's fascinating so let me ask you, Rob, do you um, have the time, wherewithal, or enough staff uh, <laughs> to, to be able to warn other people, you know, within the restaurant industry, within the bars, maybe just around the neighborhood? Uh, watch out for this guy. He's, uh, he's a loser. I wish there was some kind of network like that, something easy that restaurant owners or managers could sign into, but it's too big a, a market. There's too many places for people to hide and people to go. So, you know, the, talking to the local owners of other restaurants nearby me, sure, I can easily do that, but they tend to come from all over the city and so they'll just go somewhere else. Yeah, I can imagine that this really interrupts your business flow. I, I went through it and I lost, you know, a fair bit of, uh, you know, my hours in a day dealing with it. And I was also super annoyed and now I'm a bit chastened by it. I don't know <laughs> how much I should dedicate to, to do the interview process. But um, some companies now, Rob, have said that they are going to have group interviews, which I thought was really interesting. A, to save time and make sure they spray enough candidates that they will definitely get one. And, I'll, and B, to, to sort of show everybody in the group, you're not the only one here. It's definitely something that um, I've had other friends of mine in the corporate world do uh, because it does streamline things. Um, I have found that I've actually shortened the time that I uh, allocate for interviews. I tend to only give about 10, 15 minutes now for an initial interview to see if they're even going to show up. And once they do, that's already kind of a, a leap ahead of the other people that are interviewing with me. I have a feeling I, I know what this answer is going to be, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, after you get ghosted by somebody, do you secretly breathe a sigh of relief? Because it's like getting married and then finding out somebody's a cheater. You really wish you'd known beforehand. So do you kind of think, well, good, good riddance. Uh, you, you wouldn't have fit in, you know, anyway. Yeah, once I've given someone the, the, uh, the, the position and I've uh, come to an agreement with them onto their salary and their benefits, and I expect them to show up and they don't, well, then, yeah, it absolutely is a sigh of relief. Be like, wow, I dodged that. The professionalism isn't there. The, the follow through isn't there. So better to know now than to and to still have candidates that I've been talking with than to um, know three months in and be left with giving all of that time and training and effort into making that person part of the team, and then they just disappear. And then you're out even more time. Good money after bad. Okay, Rod Brelo, thank you so much for uh, sharing your story, and good luck with the hiring. Yeah. I hope everything works out. <laughs> thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Folks, if you are, you know, trying to pick your jaw up off the floor while at the same time muttering, damn lazy kids, um, I get it. That's exactly what I thought, too, at first. Until I remembered my parents muttering the same damn thing about my generation. Between stories about walking uphill to school on the way there and uphill to school on the way back. And you know what? We can stomp our feet all we want, right? It's not going to solve the problem. So let's go right to the source for what we might be missing here. Lillian Zhang is a 22-year-old recent graduate, and she starts a brand new job in September. She's also, uh, well, actually also 22, is Zane Violet. Um, Zane is unemployed right now at the moment, but recently declined a job offer and admits that she was very apprehensive about how to respond. And Tom Stack is a teacher of language arts and social studies at the Seven Hills School in Virginia. Welcome uh, to all of you. Lillian, I'm gonna begin with you, this question um, that I think you know people our age would sort of hurl at people your age. Are y'all just lazy or is there something we're missing here? Hi, thank you so much for having me, first of all. I definitely think it's a common stereotype that is given to a lot of Gen Z. But I don't think that it's true. There's something much deeper than that, I feel. There are so many options for 
student and Gen Z to choose from that I think when it comes to seeing all of these options presented from them, some of them might get too overwhelmed or just because everything's been conducted on Zoom for a really long time. People have so many options and when it comes to communication, sometimes it is hard to communicate because we've been doing it online for so long that the tone on email is different than the tone that you'd have on social or text or real life. It's just so different. And I think especially people yeah. my age are prioritizing different things like mental wellness, good company culture, PTO, being treated fairly, all of that. And they don't see that in the company. I think a lot of them just prefer to move on. And I actually think that Gen Z is very dedicated when it comes to causes that they care about. It's super fascinating to hear that, Lillian, because when I was your age, I just wanted that job so badly. I didn't even know what the company was going to offer. They paid me peanuts. Um, I didn't even know about benefits. It wasn't part of the you know, equation. I just wanted to get that job. It, it was a recession back in the, in the 80s. Zane, is it weird to hear this, or is this kind of like, Ashley, hey, you're finally catching on. Uh, like uh, Among your friends and peers, do you know people who've ghosted employers like this, and do you have some insight? Hi, thank you also for having me. Um, I don't find it weird at all, but I also don't know anyone who has personally taken that route of ghosting employers. Um, I actually tend to spend my time with um, peers who are a little bit older than myself, and I was also influenced by um, very, I would say, military parents. So we just didn't, like, that's just not a value that I personally uphold, but I, I do understand why a lot of this generation does do that. I do think that it is in part um, constantly having a phone in front of our face and like that's what we were raised on. And um, I do believe that it creates a little bit of a discrepancy in um, wanting to be confrontational and wanting to do things in person. Um, it's very uncomfortable because it's easier to be forthright um, with the screen in between you rather than being directly in front of another person. I, I have sensed that uh, for a couple of years now with my own kids. They're just in high school, but the all, all of their communication is via a screen and there's very little, um, you know, very little going out to play with kids on the street as they were growing up. Tom, you're a unique perspective here because not only are you a Gen Z, but you're also a teacher. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what Zane was just saying with regard to your students and also how you grew up. The notion that your lives literally have been digital. Uh, almost every aspect of your life has been has required digital communication. And then all of a sudden in the real world, we have to have real world confrontations with real faces, real voices, real people and phone calls. Yeah, I, I definitely understand that. Um, I would say that while we have had phones our whole lives um, and, and texting is kind of commonplace, um, I think that something I've talked about with my own peers, so a 24 age group, um, but also like some, some students is that kind of, we're trying to find our passion. Um, kind of the, the finding what you want to do in the world has become much more important, at least amongst my peer group. Um, like not finding the job that kind of like the first job you get, but finding one that like speaks to you. Um, and you know, that's kind of what education is meant to do, right? You're, you're meant to kind of show students have different ways of thinking um, and kind of like develop critical thinking. And hopefully along that process, they can eventually kind of discover what they're passionate about. So when they do apply to a job, they could apply in a field in which they know that they're comfortable going into it. Lillian, jump in here. Um, you know, I, when we were discussing doing this, this story, um, I thought, well, I, I certainly know about ghosting with friends and ghosting with dating apps. That's kind of standard op for a lot of people who are Gen Z and I think even millennials. But this employment one was new, and I wonder if, if this is just a natural progression because such a big part of your society is friends and dating when you're young, and then you move to working, and you just think that's normal. Do you think that that's why this is happening? I think our mindset when it comes to dating and socializing kinds of transfers onto our professional lives as well because you kind of have this subconscious mindset of ghosting. There's so many options at your fingertips that once you see something that catches your attention, maybe that attracts your attention from other things that you were dealing with. So that just kind of comes with social media in general. I also think with the rise of short form media like TikTok, Instagram Reels, everyone just has a short attention span in general. I think just kind of manifests in our lives 
just generally, there's just so many options trying to get our attention. And sometimes for a lot of people, I think it's just easier for them to move on to the next option. Yeah. I want to put up some things on the screen that I, I find super fascinating. Um, Zane, I want you to address this, if you will. This is, uh, and, and this is important because right now, your generation makes up 12% of the workforce, but in a couple of years, it's going to be 27% of the workforce. And this is what Gen Z is looking for. You want flexibility, you want work-life balance, more non-traditional employee benefits. So on top of health insurance and retirement plans, you're looking for things like paid time off, mental health days financial wellness programs, and the over, overall company culture. Uh, it's a shopping list that's really um, terrific, but I, I, only, I only look at it like, my goodness, it seems like a pipe dream. I, but if it's a buyer's market, I get it. Would, would you take a job, Zane, if the company didn't offer all of those things? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that it depends all on the, how the scales are tipped. Um, I'm one to make a pros and cons list when it comes to the offerings of the job. And um, I like to compare them to what it is that I'm ultimately looking for um, and what's best for me in my overall picture of um, health, family health, mental health, and then financial um, and material security. Um, but that's personally what I would advise other people to do. Um, but I would absolutely take a job if it didn't have everything I want, because I don't believe we can always have everything that we want. Well, you guys have been um, really eye-opening. I appreciate this. Lillian Zhang, uh, Zane Violet, and Tom Stack. Thank you, all three of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.